For a more in-depth look and complete full game reviews of all of the highlights you're about to see in this video, please go over to youtube.com slash chess. You can click on the links in the intro notes to this video and uh, make sure you check out my full video reviews there. In this particular highlights portion, we'd like to show you the more critical and perhaps most instructive and honestly just the most awesomely epic moments that were brought to us by AlphaZero, turning both his match versus Stockfish and the chess world upside down. And on that note, we have to start, of course, with Game 3, where after launching what was a, a very uh, deep, long-term, sort of slow, positional, grinded-out compensation. Yes, those were terms that were previously used to provide or to describe top grandmasters and their sacrifices like Magnus Carlsen, now describing how a computer like AlphaZero is playing chess. Uh, but the machine learning software reached a bit of a roadblock here after Stockfish has just won a second pawn and played the move knight to c5, blocking the queen's assault of the rook, which is critical because that rook needs to stay there to guard f7. But Alpha Zero already had better, deeper, bigger picture plans in mind, uh, moves that aren't even being considered right now. As you see, the evaluation bar by Stockfish thinks it's about 50-50 because it doesn't seem much more than a bunch of tickle from Alpha Zero. But uh, no, Deep Mind's tool had something else in mind, and that move was rook takes c5. Practically a double exclaim. As you, as you can see, Stockfish is like, what? I like myself a rook, and I'm going to take it. I think black is better. But the point is, Alpha Zero is not planning to take back on c5 and allow the move d6, which blocks the queen's attack of the rook, and then will allow black to start to defend the rook there, guarding f7. Maybe even the queen gets back out. No, of course, there's something else in mind, which is the immediate transfer of the queen to h4, giving up more material, partly why Stockfish missed it. And after the rook is guarded, Rook to f6, placing black in an almost impossibly difficult to imagine Zugzwang, where the queen can't move, the rook can't move due to f7, this rook can't move without this rook coming under fire, which is about to put black in a position where the only moves left are pawn moves, and we know what happens with that. Eventually, we're going to run out of pawn moves. The rook goes to f8 trying desperately to free up this rook to maybe even sacrifice itself or do anything to create counterplay, but white plays queen f4, reinvesting, doubling down on the efforts to make sure that f7 never leaves black's consciousness and keeping this queen out of play. After a few more pawn moves, white was simply doubling down on these efforts. As I said, apparently I've used doubling down more than a few times. And after the pawn comes to g5, black is already in a position that's resignable. Note that a move like rook to d4 is, is just not possible due to a numerous number of mates, including bishop takes and then queen check, followed by uh, Bob's your uncle on f8. But my favorite, Shekalina Lashlamba, would be rook takes f7, and then rook to g7 with, uh, well, a lot of things happening there against that king. So, rook d4 was not played instead a3, but now we see the queen use that opportunity for another target, grab yet another weakness on the board. If the queen hadn't sacrificed herself on f6, the lady would have come back to f3, keeping an eye on not just f7 now, but also the a8 square, allowing this a pawn to just run up the board and the game would be over. So like any good computer, Stockfish doesn't resign, instead makes unnecessary sacrifices, but in a few moves of realizing that he truly is frozen out of any winning chances, uh, the uh, the big fish does throw in the towel. That was our Game 3 review and brought to you in, like we said, this most bite-sized version of how AlphaZero dominated the world's strongest open source machine. Now we're going to move on to the coverage of Game 5, which really... Things got super exciting in this moment here. Black has just played the move king to h8 to stop the threat of knight f6 check, which would have won the queen due to the fact that the pawn is pinned. Thinking maybe the worst is over, now there's threats of f5 and black should be fine. The white had a brilliant move here. One of my favorite moves from the entire match, bishop to g5. Uh, the key point here is it renews the threat of knight f6. If knight f6 comes in, let's say for example on d5, the point is the knight cannot be taken as that'll be mate on the next move. But if the queen moves anywhere on this diagonal, white now has a brilliant inner mizzo, bishop to e4. Guerrilla warfare, blocking the queen from protecting the king side, and after takes, queen f5, there's no way to deal with the mate on f7 without taking here, which will also lead to a simple mate in a few moves. So uh, bishop g5, really a, a caveman approach to the king side, breaking through with, with no other options. Um, led to black having to play f5 in order to stop knight f6, but it didn't matter. Queen f4 pinned the f-pawn, and after a few more moves, knight to c5, bishop e7, knight to d3, white showed willingness to sacrifice more material because the mating net and the threats of knight f6 followed by bishop f6 and the rook infiltrating was enough for black to have to take the knight, 
block with the rook, and white wins back the material brilliantly with the move g4. And the moment white goes up the exchange in this game after rook e8 check, bishop g8, and bishop g3, c5, queen d5, the game was just over with the rook falling. Again, it all comes back to an attack that was launched in brute force method with this move bishop g5. And But but still notice the subtlety, right? White doesn't even go for the slightly sloppy version of winning the pin rook immediately. Instead plays bishop f4 so that now in any lines where the rook moves, there's easier ways for us to get queen f8 and rook to e8. Those are the things that force black to have to block on, on g8 with the bishop and eventually allowed white to just win all the material. Note that if c5 wasn't played allowing queen d5, sitting on the position isn't going to help either. White has bishop e5 coming, which completely freezes the queen from ever being able to move due to queen takes h6, just to show that. Any, any random move is going to allow queen takes h6, followed by bishop takes g7 mate. And checks are futile. I love using that word because they're only just one check or two. And again, black will just have to bring the queen back. White's just going to continue to crush forward with black being completely frozen. That's why Stockfish decided instead of a5 that he would risk his chances in the endgame with c5. But again, white won the rook and went on to win a very nice endgame. So that moment, that moment with bishop g5, recognizing the awkwardness of the out of play pieces on the queen side is exactly why alpha zero took down Stockfish in game five. Game eight. This was fun. Not nearly the same, we'll call it sexiness, that game three and five brought us as far as uh, awesome sacrifices, long-term compensation, and uh, mating attacks, really. But this one here all came down to one move where Stockfish, again, look at the evaluation, thinks that Black is defending. Black is currently up a pawn, by the way, and thinks that with the queen offer on e7, I'm not worried anymore about you bringing a rook to the h-file, and you don't have any real chances of mating me. Alpha Zero says, okay, but I don't need the mate to win, plays the move, queen to f6. This move was a, a brilliant t uh, placement of the queen and really highlighting that black has bigger problems than whether he gets mated on the h-file. Mainly these, these problems are highlighted after takes and takes. Let's say black just sits tight. There's, there's really no moves here. Black was totally frozen. And again, check out the full game review over at youtube.com slash chess. But the point is, slowly, slowly building up and getting positions where the pressure on the h-file is real, G5 would never be an option due to things like H6, followed by taking here and, and mating nets to follow. H6 is never an option due to this. So black is literally without access to the D file, sitting tight, the most likely option. Eventually, white's going to get full positions where he can then threaten to infiltrate on the A file. Taking here is still never going to be an option. White will just flip the script and grab the H file. And even the end game with the rooks off the board is easily winning due to the fact that black has no moves. Bishop to e5, followed by a king infiltration, is going to get us into an endgame where human... Look at the... This really shows. Look at the computer valuation, thinking white's better, but not really realizing that this position is resignable. Black has no moves, no way out of anything with the king. Just sit. It doesn't matter what moves you want to make. Eventually, your king comes up, drops the bishop on d6, whether you trade or not and create my opportunities, or if you just continue to sit tight. Eventually, the king will come in, white will trade, and go dominate on the queen side, probably trapping the bishop in the process, winning without any counterplay having ever been had by black. And again, it was this brilliant move, queen f6, that really highlighted that black's position was completely busted. Finally seeing the writing on the wall, Stockfish didn't trade into the endgame, he moved the queen, but that allowed white to get back to the h-file and eventually force matters to be just as bad when the queen endgame, when the queens did come off and the endgame was had. The threat of the bishop coming to g5, followed by bishop f6, tactics over here on the h-file, forced black to play the move c3, which turns his protected pass pawn into a vulnerable lost pony. That's what white did. White gobbled it up. Now, with no more material advantage on the board, it was simply a matter of technique. White's going to start simplifying and uh, trading into an endgame where, again, you have a horribly bad bishop versus a dominant white counterpart, and uh, black goes on to just lose the game very quickly with no real way to deal with white dominating the only access points in the game. So uh, just a super awesome position and, and really instructive technique, starting with this move, queen f6. We'll show the rest of the moves because, hey, we're already here. Let's do it. Let's show you how the b5 pawn fell and with it the rest of the game. So uh, a more a more grinded out affair there in, in game eight, but still alpha zero showing he can not just sacrifice for mate, but play really great positional chess. That's what he did with queen f6.
We had our lone non-D4 game. This was the lone French defense of the match, uh, at least the games that were published so far by Alpha Zero and Stockfish. And nothing was more impressive than this French game because after Knight takes D2, Alpha Zero shocked us. Obviously, we know in the French, you got you got to. You're going to have to take back your material here, and obviously your goal is to hold down the center so that you can focus your efforts on an attack on the king's side. This is just French chess 101. The way to do that can't be done with the queen because of bishop b4, which means obviously we have to take with the knight, get castled, get the king safe so that we can focus our efforts where we know white needs to in a French, which of course is on the king's side. But apparently Alpha Zero had deeper, more brilliant ideas in mind. He takes with the king and says, yeah, I know I have to attack. And in fact, why make anybody else have the duty of holding the center together if I can get my king to do it? And just like that, we were like, what? White's position is just completely crushing. B6, G4, White starts rolling through on the king's side in a way that Black really has no ability to deal with. And we see the king is doing more on E3 than any king has ever done in the history of any French game. No more castles and put the king in the corner. Let's all play uh, like Alpha Zero and use our king to hold down that big French pawn structure. The position opens up, and I have to show you the rest of this game because nothing was more exciting than when White finally started bringing the dynamic house down on the king's side. Using the c5 was strong. By the way, don't take on b6 because of king to c7. And eventually we reached a critical moment where, okay, yes, we know that when you hold all the cards, you control the c-file and the king's side. You can pick and choose whether you want to be aggressive or just kind of sit on the progress. But normally you shouldn't sacrifice without something immediately coming down against the king because otherwise why give up your big space advantage, right? <clears throat> Apparently Alpha Zero understood this position deeper than anybody else. He gives up the piece and doesn't need to mate the king immediately. If black takes it, yes, we will have checkmate. Just takes e6, takes b6, and I'm uh, pretty sure that's the goods right there. But the problem is, and just like Stockfish thinks, as you see, Stockfish still likes black with that evaluation bar. I can take here, can I? Now you're not getting e6, and I'll take here next. Alpha Zero's like, duh, I know. I'll just take back with the queen and then continue to roll forward. I don't care that I'm down a piece because I control all the squares. Super instructive to remember what Petrosian and all the chess gods have taught us. Yes, material is worth something, and the point values we give them mean something in the open board if they have power. But if they're not, the board isn't open and your pieces are trapped, and if white controls all the access points by dominating the dark squares... It doesn't matter that I'm down a piece. The ability to create threats is the more important factor. You can't take here because of check, followed by rook to c7, uh, or even take h8, and black's just winning. Taking with the e-pawn would allow queen f6, and there's no way to deal with the threat of queen d6 mate and save the rook at the same time. So, Stockfish played rook g8, but after queen h6, renewing threats on the 7th rank, and then f6, we saw that white literally has no moves. Nothing was more instructive, though, than the fact that after it seems to run out, white threatens queen a3, which would have meant, again, a big problem. So forces black to play queen f8 and offer the queen trade. And uh, we see that, again, white doesn't need the queens on the board to win up the piece. Rook to g1, gobbles the pawn. Note that there's no real activity balance here. If black tries to go for things like rook h8 and do any kind of race, there's no real race to be won because white's pawns are just too far up the board and um, black, is, black is losing all the material. So giving up the B-pawn as much as you don't want to do it was pretty much forced, and uh, that led to White getting an easier access, uh, easy, easier open highway to the queen side, eventually opening things up with A5, and the counterplay being devastating on the darks, whereas again, the key is that there's just threats and real problems for Black. Moving the bishop will always allow things like F7. Um, moving the rook will allow the bishop to hang. There's threats of F7 anyway. Black is completely lost, and for good measure, like any good computer, Stockfish gave up one more pawn before throwing in the towel, and then says, all right, I know it, I'm dead, and I resign. Brings us to our final game, game 10, where Alpha Zero wins yet again, and no attack more weird in the sense that the, the kind of subtle moves that were played to keep this mating net going had everybody's head spinning. The first thing is, okay, you've already induced g5, it's a weakness, let's get the knight out of dodge and try to build up and try to open up these dark squares slowly. Alpha Zero is like, silly human, you don't need to do that, just give up the knight. It's no big deal, just let it go, I don't care. Yeah, I don't care, you have it, you have it. And Sockfish is like, me? You, I can have that knight? He's like, yeah, dude, it's totally cool, just take it. So he takes it. Then h4, just builds up on the attack slowly. Develops pieces, down a piece. Why not just develop? 
yeah, you're attacking my queen, but I can swing over and, all right, you're attacking my queen again, but I don't even need my pieces to be on the most aggressive squares. Queen h1 will do. I've got all my pieces on the first rank besides a couple bishops, and I'm going to spend the next few moves just trading off pieces to open up lines against the king. The main point being that even with the simplification, the inability to get the queenside pieces in the game is what's going to kill black. If that knight ever moves, you're going to see it will constantly be opening up squares or undefending things like the c6 pawn. All of these factors are going to keep black off balance in a way that we've never seen Stockfish look so silly. Here comes white. One trade being offered. I'm going to bring in more pieces and offer yet another trade after I grab the h file. We're going to trade on d4. More trades, just opening up lines, making that king feel more and more naked. And after the trade here in queen e6, we finally see the real truth, which is that whole time white wasn't down a piece. White was up a rook. Because like any good abusive Russian chess coach would do, just come up and take those pieces off the board. And, uh, and black's not even using them. Black realizing that the writing is on the wall with queen e5 check and the rook infiltrating finally does develop that knight, knowing he's going to lose material to rook d1. Uh, note that Without any move besides the move Stockfish played, which was knight c5, it's just going to allow rook takes d7. And it's not just about the knight. It's about that I'm either winning the queen or I'm continuing a mating net over here on the king's side. So letting that knight be taken was not an option. Knight c5 let white gobble and head to the end game. And again, like a good Russian schoolboy, white takes his time, defending threats, not falling for any forks. Just don't take that pawn and allow knight d6 check, and you're going to be just fine. Alpha Zero knows that. A little bit of tickle, a little bit of tickle, get some pawns, get some pieces, play king d4. Once again, avoid that fork for the last time and force black to resign because now there's nothing to stop rook takes, rook takes b5 and uh, stockfish simply threw in the towel. So on that note, we bring our quick highlight version, our bite-sized version of what the most critical moments were from all of these games. Again, if you're looking for full game review breakdowns, I put a lot of work into understanding what happened here, uh, but not everybody has the time to watch five 20-minute videos. Uh, but if you do and you really want to see more, please head over to YouTube slash chess and uh, check out everything there, all the full game reviews, uh, or go to our Twitch video library. You can check out our collections there. Again, all the full video libraries exist at twitch.tv slash chess. You'll find all five in-depth game reviews over there. Thanks for uh, watching. If you haven't subscribed yet to my YouTube channel, please do it, and we'll see you around on chess.com.